Welcome to the Talking Toughness series of podcasts, where we examine the mental toughness concept with guests from a wide range of sectors, illustrating that our mental approach to what happens to us and around us matters for all of us. Our guests come from the worlds of business and public service, education, social mobility, sport and health. They all share their experiences and their observations about the factors that have enabled them to survive and to thrive on their journey through life. Many guests have gone further and incorporated the concept into what they do as coaches, trainers, managers and leaders, helping others to thrive in their turn. Their experiences are valuable to those of us who strive to do the same. Our guest today is Binod Shankar, someone who we have come to know very well over many years. Based in Dubai, Binod is well known across the Middle East as the founder of what is now known as Kaplan Genesis, the leading providers of training for chartered accountants in the region. Now, Binod is a regular TV pundit on financial and economic affairs, and is a passionate advocate of proactive strategies for success in life and in work. Now, Binod has turned his attention to becoming a successful coach for aspiring chartered accountants and business leaders. Since training in the use of the mental toughness concept, he's also incorporated that into much of his work. Now, what makes this podcast really interesting is that Binot is one of the most thoughtful and inquisitive people we know, and he reflects on everything he comes across. Usefully, he's prepared to share those reflections with anyone who's prepared to listen to him which is what makes these podcasts really valuable. It's always interesting. He's never dull. We welcome Binod to this discussion. Hi, Binod. Welcome. It's so good to see you. How are you? I'm good, Doug. Uh, we have been having chats off and on for the last quite a few years. So, But I'm, <clears throat> my, my pleasure is seeing Dr. John Perry. Um, not a brilliant a Dr. John Perry. <laughs> <laughs> The, the brilliant Dr. John Perry, who is a good friend of mine. <laughs> Thanks very much. You, uh, you, you, you make me blush. Unfortunately, it's only, it's only audio and not video. The video would have captured the blush. I think we have to start with this, with Let's yes. Get Real, the book that you've just published. And yes. from what we see, it's something like hotcakes all over the place. And yeah. I suppose there are two questions that we start with, Binod. Why the book? And right. why so much reference to the mental toughness concept? But let's start with why the book. So I think the journey started a decade ago when I was on search for a framework for high performance or special performance. And I was struggling to find a framework and then, of course, stumbled into uh, mental toughness and uh, all those things. But why the book? I think uh, from my interactions with myself, and others, Doug, <clears throat> especially over the course of career that covered about 30 years, I found that most people have similar problems. We are not as unique as we like to think. I found that the issues that I struggled with, which are mostly behavioral, you know, uh, people management and self-management issues, were being faced by others <clears throat> of in, 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 in the domain that I was in, irrespective of age or qualifications. <clears throat> and that is one part. Secondly, I, I used to post, and I still post regularly on LinkedIn, Doug, as you know. <clears throat> and some of those posts used to get a lot of traction. I used to wonder why. And then I went back and the, the themes were about self-awareness and challenges and um, <clears throat> what, how do you get stuck in your career? How do you get unstuck in your career? <clears throat> um, good workplaces, bad workplaces, and mindset. So I thought, hmm, maybe there's, there's scope for a book in it. And I actually started writing a book about a decade ago on CFA, which was my bread and butter and, and jam for quite some time. I thought, you know, rather than write a book about an exam or how to prepare for an exam, let me write a book about how to prepare for a career or how to prepare for leadership. It made more sense to me especially at this stage and age of my life. I'm 54 now. I, I know I look much younger, but uh, I, I'm, I'm, 
I was waiting for you to say yeah, that, but since you didn't I, say that, I, I, I was saying, yeah, that you, you left that pause. Yeah, Doug was um, just smoking at me, yeah. and he didn't, he didn't volunteer any compliments. So I, had to sort of I, yeah. I see what you did there. You you realized that this is not a this is not a video podcast. Therefore, I can say what I want. <laughs> exactly, John. Hence the book, Doug. And um, someone also last week referred to it, and I didn't realize it actually. Till he said it, he said, it's actually an autobiography of yourself, you know, you realize that in, a, in some shape or form. And I thought, yes, actually, it's true, because I suppose once you're very honest and um, open about things, it does tend to reflect your history and your personality in more ways than one. So that's my longish answer to why the book and the second part, I think, was about mental toughness. And that goes back to my, and I think I mentioned that in the book somewhere, where I went running with a couple of friends. I was training for the marathon, and I was asking this school teacher, a Canadian lady who was running with me, and I was asking her about special performance and my struggle to find a framework to explain or to boost or diagnose that extra performance, the extra juice that people need in careers and sports and she said, why don't you Google mental toughness? I don't know that whether she had heard about AQR or, or Peter Clough for yourself. Dad, but, and then I Googled that. Then I came across your emails. I shot off an email to Peter and yourself. You replied. And then, you know, then, of course, uh, John came to Dubai and we had this uh, fantastic three-day uh, mental toughness license user session, which I still have notes of, by the way, somewhere here, right next to me, handy. Yeah, just no, in case I did refer was, to it. That was 10 years ago, wasn't it? I know. Was that, it was, was that 2013, was it? It was 2013, I think. Yeah, good. Yeah, October or November 2013. It's almost 10 years now. And and um, so I think mental toughness to me, it, it's it, look, it's not it's not the perfect all-encompassing framework. There's no such thing. Uh, but it, to me, it's probably the best possible framework where you can say to someone, "Listen, this is probably what you need." Or, or from the diagnosis or from the test. These, these, are the, these are things you could do to improve your, whatever it is, right? Your commitment, your control, your challenge, your confidence, you know, the, the, the four pillars, wherever you feel you're short in. Um, and uh, so that was, that was my introduction to mental toughness. Hence the, the, the reference to mental toughness uh, in the book, because it was and still remains to me the most um, complete um, measure, diagnosis, um, toolkit. Yeah, that is the word I was looking for, actually. Hmm. Toolkit to pull yourself up and, and, you know, without any fancy jargon or, 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 or psychometrics or medications. <laughs> <laughs> um, and get where, and, and fulfill your potential, which is probably what a lot of people struggle with. I think that's uh, that's really good to hear, Bill, because uh, I, I I think you're describing our purpose with when we first picked up the concepts uh, from Peter. Our reason for doing that was to help people to be self-aware and help people to somehow improve, whether it's their performance, their well-being, or whatever. I was interested in a little comment you made right at the beginning, where you said, "On reflection, most people have got similar problems," and he said they're mostly behavioural, which is, of course, yes. is very good news for psychologists. It gives them a reason for, for being. Yes. What do you think are the most common behavioural issues? What are the, the, the co those common behavioural issues? Oh, wow, that's uh, another podcast, Doug. But, <laughs> but <laughs> let me try and give a stab, stab at it. Yeah. So, from, so my experience has been in finance and accounting and leading teams and then switched to entrepreneurship and then managing teams and then teaching students about finance and accounting. And now, of course, I coach uh, senior executives. So if I look back and think, I think one major issue that sort of stands out is confidence or lack of confidence. And you see that um, I, to an astonishing degree where it really holds people back from what they could do. And you see it among women, you see it in minorities, you see it in, and you no, know, without sounding racist, you see it, for example, mostly in Asian 
uh, with Asian population, uh, South Asia, India, for example, Pakistan. You see it. So you see this in, uh, of course, in fresh graduates who are who are naive and not experienced enough. Um, it's, I mean, it's so widespread. Um, and this lack of confidence is probably just a catch-all phrase that I'm using here. Though. But it, 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 at least in the in the South, the Asian mindset or the Asian culture, this is also driven by what the fear of what people think. That also manifests itself. I suppose I would call it a lack of confidence. And I remember speaking at a big uh, to a big bunch of uh, chartered accountants last year in Bahrain, and and I put up this uh, phrase. It's in Hindi. It's called "log kya kahenge," which means translation in English is "What will people think?" And I said, um, "Why does this happen to most of you?" Uh, and they all said one word. Uh, they all shouted one word: fear. Fear of being judged, fear of failure, fear of um, looking bad. I mean, it's just, and, and that probably is in some ways inextricably linked with confidence. Uh, maybe I, I don't know that's the right term to use or self esteem or whatever, but that is what I see a lot of the time, um, whether it's coaching clients or young students studying for CFA. Like uh, they want to do it, they know it's important. Uh, they know that they'll be held back and they won't meet their potential unless they do it. But this big but, right? Probably the big but is what will people think? Um, and it's such a, again, it's a, it's a culture of, a lot of people are brought up in this culture of shame mm -hmm. where the, the possibility of shame is far higher than the possibility of success. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, the emotional impact, sorry, the emotional impact of shame is bigger than the emotional impact of success. It's a very asymmetric relationship. So that's my um, long answer, Doug. It's, it's lack of confidence. And uh, that's what that was separates the 99% from the 1% as well, I suppose. Um, assuming talents and skills are equally distributed, which I know they are not, but still, you know, uh, uh, mm -hmm. and Confidence is definitely something. And I, and I say confidence because I suppose, again, we are, I suppose we'll delve in, but it's something that can be improved, that can be boosted. But it's, not, it's not something fixed. That's, uh, that, that's what, what I was wondering there, Ben, as, yeah. you, were, as you were talking. And I, I think it's a great point because I've, I've often had this kind of perception where people almost have this, this idea of where my place is in the world. Um, and you see it, whether it's uh, societal, cultural, linked to socioeconomic status, whatever it might be, but that sense of, well, that's my place in the world. Sure, what would I be doing trying to go mm. and do X, Y, and Z? That's for other people. Um, and it sounds quite similar there to, to what you described. And it's that, I think it's really nice explain that asymmetric relationship between the the shame of failure is much greater than the pride associated with with the success and that's what kind of um puts people into that so um given that cultures kind of embed that way of thinking from mm. such a, a young age how do you how do you try and break that down so if you were working with someone as a coach how do you go look mm. like you you, you've got this preconceived idea that's yeah. leading to, you know, you, you're not pushing yourself, not lifting your head above the parapet. Um, mm. So how, how, do we, how do we overcome years of, I suppose, environmental persuasion? Yeah, well, that, that, that's a very good question. And <clears throat> I mean, there's several ways of doing it, I suppose. And I'd love to hear from you as well. Um, but one way is to, I mean, self-awareness is definitely essential. And mm. when I mean, and Doug Ben referred to self-awareness and how mental toughness helps you uncover those parts of yourself. I think in, in the context of confidence boosting, John, I think it's more of uh, what, are, what are the saboteurs sitting on my shoulder and whispering to me whenever I want to do something important. And I have a young mentee who has actually had a fairly traumatic childhood with a very, with a hypercritical father. 
And to this day, she's not that, she's 23 now. She just, to this day, she struggles with doing anything new. And she almost has to write down with a pen and paper that it's just, it's, it's, not, it's not me. It's just a feeling. It's just a belief. I can do it and I will do it. She literally has to write it down. Mm. So, so I think the saboteurs that we have. Um, so, so a lot of, again, going back to the culture I referred to, Dr. John, um, in those cultures, you are brought up to believe that you're not good enough, that you can always do better. Uh, while mm. that is that has led to some tremendous success, as you can see, the Indian diaspora around the world, right? From <clears throat> whether it is Satya Nadella or Rishi Sunak or anyone, uh, that has had some devastating effects on the psychology when they grow up to be adults, when they feel that uh, they are never good enough, and hence they don't have a seat, and hence they don't deserve a seat at the table. Mm. Yeah, and, and we've always got to be aware, I think, of yeah, um, like the kind of survivor bias issue yes. when you yes, point exactly. to, so yeah, you, you can name some people that have come from that kind of background yes. and, and, and had some, some form of success. Yes. But uh, I, I'm always reminded there was a, a cartoon sort of image I saw years ago of this guy... Uh, giving a TED talk with like just loads of bags of money around him saying mm -hmm. I uh, people said I was an idiot for spending every penny I got on the lottery but look who's laughing now you should all right. go out and spend every penny you get on the lottery you know as a sort of mm -hmm. uh, all the people that did that and didn't win yes. well, they're not on the stage giving the talk no <laughs> and, exactly. and, yeah. and I think sometimes we can make this incorrect assertion that we do it in sport all the time. Like you look mm. at some attributes of a particular athlete who happens to be really successful. You know, let's look at Mike Tyson. We go, geez, look how successful he was. Everyone should be like Mike Tyson. No, mm. the vast majority of people who are like Mike Tyson have horrible lives. <laughs> Don't be like that. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's really interesting. Yeah. And the the other thing, what made me think when I when I saw the title of the book, like Let's Get Real. I thought, God, there'd be so many ways of interpreting that. Mm. But one thing that that struck me when you start, you you opened up by saying um, that we all kind of like to believe that we're different, and yes. I absolutely, hundred percent, I find that all the time. Whenever we do the mental toughness talks, right? Oh, yes. you, you could literally you go from one village to the next and somebody really? would be saying ah but that might be different for us no yes. <laughs> you, you're no. not that different <laughs> um and, and and i think what i what i kind of like about that uh, way that you're talking about it is i i think the realness requires and you mentioned self-awareness a bit of acceptance over who we are so um in a world full of you know, internet memes of saying, oh, if you can see it and dream it, you can achieve mm. anything. Like, we know that probably 50 to 60% of all the attributes of mental toughness are genetically informed. Like, mm. And I love that sort of, it's still positive psychology. It's still yeah. really seeing how you can savor and flourish and thrive and do all those kind of things in this sort of more realistic way of you're not going to become a completely different no. person you let's look at what you've got and and how we work with that and mm. is, is 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 would that be kind of in keeping with this ethos you have of like getting real yeah so it's interesting i'm looking at my phone as we're speaking and on, on 11th of June, someone asked me what my definition of being real was. And I made a few notes. So this is, this is, this is quite handy now. Mm. And this is a long list, but I'll just read out some of this. One was always reflect on your experiences. Uh, mm -hmm. Know what you're brilliant at and what you suck at. Mm -hmm. uh, seek discomfort, which will then lead to change. And know your values well and never deviate from this. So those are some of the elements, you know, admit your flaws and screw up sincerely and swiftly. Um, 
So I suppose, I mean, I could go on and on, but I think being real, it's not about being authentic. And that word authentic has been abused or misused uh, or misinterpreted many ways, you know, I mean, but, uh, and, but I think real is for me captures, uh, it's basically, and, and goes back to what you said, it's, it's very difficult to accept who you are, John, sometimes. Mm. Uh, especially the, when you get negative feedback and you know it's true, but you don't want to accept it, right? Knowing something and accepting something are two different things. Um, mm. so if you can do that, that's being real. You know? um, that's, that's being real and uh, trying not to rely too much on external validation because I think being real also, and I've had recent discussions with friends who are going through volatile times and they seem to have an issue with being comfortable with themselves. They're never comfortable with themselves. They don't love themselves. Mm. I don't mean love themselves in a narcissistic, uh, egoistic way, but yeah, just know what I'm saying. Just be comfortable in your own skin. That yeah. And it's quite... So I was having, just before I came, I was having a coffee chat with one of my old uh, students and um, and he was telling me that I put a lot of my life on social media and my life is very transparent. And my reply was, you had to be pretty confident to do that. And he said, yes, you're right, it's spot on. Mm. You have to admit that you screwed up and you have flaws and, uh, you know, you, you have, and that's you. But that's, mm. but that's okay. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 quite um, stoic, really, isn't it? That sort of uh, sense of, um, I suppose, rec- recognition of yourself, and not not necessarily. Um, it it's good to strive to be as good as you can be at stuff, mm. but um, but you never want to be striving to be someone else. Like a a phrase. Yeah. The phrase I often hear people say is around about this kind of like, once I manage to do X, Y, and Z, then I'll be happy. Yes. And you think that is that sense of rather than just loving yourself for who you are now, accepting the flaws, the things you suck at, you're kind of going, right, this person's not satisfactory to me. So what I'm striving for is this non-real version of Mm. myself. Um, and geez, how's that person ever going to move forward being mm. honest in their reflection and you know thinking positively and, and before I forget you asked me how to boost confidence and the second part well one answer was to try and identify the saboteurs John in your life right the people who are mm. the, the second one which I was thinking of when you were speaking was just do it you know? um, and, and I found many occasions by when you have fear of something and you lack confidence in something, it's probably because you haven't done it and, mm. and um, or you did it the wrong way, you know, <clears throat> or the wrong guidance and, or the wrong framework. And then you realize when you do it properly, um, whether it's climbing a mountain or cycling or teaching or swimming or whatever, then you realize that, wow, it wasn't as tough as I thought it would be. And I'm actually enjoying the experience after some time when you become competent at it, right? And then once you become competent, confidence even goes, and then it becomes a virtuous cycle, right? As so, I always tell people just do it. You know, just start in a small way, whether it's a small LinkedIn post or you know, a, mm. a short walk. You don't need to run a marathon to start your fitness journey. Um, yeah, just doing it actually helps. I mean, I assembled IKEA. I assembled an IKEA table two weeks ago, and I never assembled an IKEA table in my life or anything like IKEA in my life. And, I was dreading what would happen to me because I, I don't like to use tools and I always thought I was, how do you say, um, I had two, two left thumbs or whatever they call them, right? I never, <laughs> and I was dreading it. I, I, was hope, I was wishing that, damn, I'd, I'd, I'd wish, I wish I had asked the IKEA guys to deliver and assemble the one. But it was done in less than an hour. And mm. I, I was looking back and thinking, why was I so anxious and so... Mm cared about this whole thing. It's just a simple, I can, I mean, they, they had a manual which could be read by a three-year-old <laughs> uh, and uh, so simple and clear and it was just a simple table. So I think we sort of psych ourselves out before every event. Mm. 
what we call the fear of failure uh, john is more than the prospect of success um mm. yeah in finance then, we call it the loss aversion bias it's called loss aversion yeah. bias where people will um, will stick to a particular mindset rather than exploit you know opportunities yeah yeah 100 100 um yeah loss loss aversion would be i know like a lot of economic literature um, yeah. <laughs> that sort of leads into into the psych stuff talks talks about that too and i think yeah. um the there's also an interesting link there with uh procrastination um I keep mm. thinking eventually i'll do a, a mm. some study on um linked to procrastination because that I, I know procrastination sort of um it exaggerates the perspective of the task so yes. when when you were required to do your bit of diy yes you you pause and think how am i going to do this yes um and because you've got you know 42 ways of <laughs> of, of kind of pushing through something um you're able to do that if you if you didn't have any strategy in place there yeah you might actually put that off a day and then a week and then yes. a couple of weeks and in that time you kind of lose all perspective because that 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 tiny little weight on the back of your mind has multiplied over a yes. period of time so when you procrastinate you just completely lose perspective on yes how hard this thing is Correct. and then eventually you get around to it and go why why did i wait why yeah. didn't i just yeah. do it um so yeah I, I i think it's great advice to kind of just do it a sports brand should trademark it um i think <laughs> it's uh because it i i often think that one of the one of the biggest mistakes we make one of the fallacies with motivation is thinking that it's this sort of linear relationship between motivation and action, you know, as if mm. uh, I reckon we've all done it at some point, you, you'll be sat somewhere doing nothing. And if someone said, what are you doing? Say, I'm motivating myself to do this. I'm getting yeah. the motivation to do something. Yeah. Whereas actually, if you just started performing the action, you would get some sort of hormone based response initially to mm. it. And then you have an appraisal of that response. Yeah. And uh, so that kind of just do it to me is this sense of you, you don't fall into the trap of seeing motivation as the driver of action. Like mm. that's a that's a sort of circular relationship. You can just yeah. start with the action sometimes. Um, yes. I know that whenever I'm tired and I walk my dog because he's looking at me and I'm thinking I do not have the motivation right now to go out in the pouring rain. Yes. Um, but you have to. So yes. you just kind of start with it. And then 10 minutes later, oh, what do you know? I actually feel good. I do have energy. I was yeah. kidding myself all along. Great. I mean, talking about that particular thing about regular habits, whether it's fitness or your finances, uh, Atomic Habits by James Clear has this wonderful concept that if you make a habit as part of your identity, then you'll never give it up. Mm, love this bit about just do it, uh, Bernard. And yeah. John, I think you've just explained to me, for me, why I reply so quickly to emails. Right. <laughs> if I sit there and I think, and I think, I think, I think too long about an email, it just weighs on my mind. And I think the easiest thing to do is just reply. 